Oh, I am behind. I am behind, but I am here. Let's transition. Bam. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Brendan, and this is Accidental Origin, the weekly writing web show, uh, where we're continuing on our short story adventure. Uh, so yeah. Um, what am I thinking? What am I thinking? Uh, how's the audio? Is the fan too loud? Because it is ridiculously warm here. Uh, so I would prefer to keep it on. Uh, but yeah, it's kind of loud. If, if it's too loud, I'll turn it off. Uh, maybe I'm testing out some different things because there's a lot a lot of white noise and I agree with you that I prefer that there would be some white noise but I can't really like I keep trying to find a balance and it doesn't work I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I know. That's what I have said to. I don't know. See, like, now it's... Yeah, well, I mean, that's for film, right? Like, that's not exactly, it's not exactly the same thing. No, there's no issue. I said it to do that on purpose. <laughs> not an issue. Cause I just, every time I try, it just gets ridiculous. Whatever. Oh, fine, I'll leave it open. Or did it, oh, uh, no, never mind. one sec. Those levels, though, they are bad. I don't know. I don't know if there's much I can do about it at this point, but it's probably too late.
Yeah, well, you want to punch me usually anyway, Rob. Seems better. Am I too quiet now though? Ugh, I hate audio. It's so hard. Why is it so hard? question that's a good question I do not know the answer either but fair enough okay so we're gonna try it like that see if that helps let me know if I'm too quiet so I've turned it down a lot so Maybe that'll be better? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, see, this is my problem. How about now? Is that better? Better or worse? That's better. Okay. Yeah, my computer is very loud at the moment. Probably actually adjust that a little bit. actually get this show on the road um so it's extremely hot today i apologize i'm gonna be mad sweaty um the humidity is is in the ridiculous at the moment um It is 31 degrees Celsius right now, which explains a lot. Explains a lot. So yeah, I'm gonna be really hot. <laughs> um, last night I tried out VR for the first time. It was super legit. Um, the amount of cool storytelling things that I want to experiment with is enormous. Um, yeah, totally worth it. <laughs> oh my god. Um, so yeah, uh, that was awesome. Uh, and just other random news about me, uh, on Monday, so tomorrow, I'm starting the, uh, edits for Game Chef, 
so uh, it's the like selection round where we all give each other feedback and and select a, a the community votes for for who goes through into the finals. Uh, so that that starts tomorrow. So that's another cool thing that I'm gonna be doing. Um, Cause I don't have enough work to do, obviously. <laughs> yeah, no. All the work, all the time. Um, so there's certainly that. Um, what else? Oh, I think that's it. I think that's it. Uh, I'm still, uh, wow. Focus, focus, Bureau, focus. Okay, uh, so I did do uh, I did do another weekday stream uh, on Thursday this time, uh, and I did a bunch of web updates. So I worked on the website and made some cool changes and stuff. Uh, for those who have never been there, it's right here, right there. On the screen, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a uh, there's a bunch of stuff that's been updated on there. Uh, I'm gonna keep making updates to that this week. Uh, there's a few things I'm planning on putting up there, including uh, some reviews of the books for the book club. Uh, maybe some reviews in general. I'm still playing around with that, uh, but I had considered doing. Uh, like whenever I finish watching a movie or media or something or stuff that's modern or relevant, then I can review those as well. Still playing around with that stuff, so let me know if uh, you have a preference or if you have suggestions or comments or whatever. Uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, you can do so on the website or also on Twitter at Free Cloud Mishaps. Um, or so just send me a message on Twitch, though that's less likely to get to me, but you never know. So yeah. Uh, so I did that. Uh, we're gonna continue now, well, since since the, the main part of the competition, Game Chef competition is over, uh, I'm going to be continuing on the short story today. So we're gonna keep working towards uh, keep talking about to like writing topics uh, this week. So there's that. Um, anything else I wanted to touch on? No, weekly art. Yeah. Nope, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> uh, as far as I can tell. On my little note list here. Just gonna add one thing. Cool. So there is that. Uh, I did get some of the show notes for episodes five and six done, but I still have to finish those, and I will. I promise. I promise. I will. It's one of those things where I just need to sit down and do it. Uh, so yeah. I I will I will get that done this week. <laughs> It's really hot, okay? It's really hot. Not to mention, I have lights on. And no fans, because fans are loud. My computer fan by itself is loud enough. <laughs> so, there's that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, what are we doing this week? <laughs> I, f yeah, I feel super rambly. Ram no. I feel super rambly right now. Okay. Main 
screen. Oops. So, what are we going to talk about this week? This week, we're going to talk about structure and outlines. Uh, and I'm going to try and do my best and not just talk theory at people, at you guys, and uh, apply what I'm talking about to the short story we're working on. Um, for those who are new, I'm not sure if there are any new people here, but if there are people watching the VODs or whatever, uh, for those who are new, uh, the story we're working on is a classical fantasy story. So based, based more on the fantasy tropes of mythology than the fantasy tropes of uh, high fantasy, uh, like Lord of the Rings style. Um, I have done a brief synopsis, a log line, and uh, some, some brainstorming with uh, the various characters and settings and stuff uh, that were randomly generated uh, from a drawing prompt website because yeah why not it's good to mix mix your mediums and, and try new things so yeah Oh yeah, and I totally missed. So this week um, I have done a partial outline, not a full outline like I had done in the past, uh, because I felt like I was missing. <laughs> I thought that I was missing um, a lot of my thought process, like during the game design episodes. Like I, I, I didn't feel like I was directing my energy properly. So this time I tried to just do uh, headings. So nothing nothing too much, but just headings. So hopefully, um, hopefully that'll keep me on track. So yeah, <laughs> we'll see. I'm not doing so great so far, so yeah. <laughs> but you know, learning process, right? learning process. We're all here to learn. I'm here to learn. I'm still pretty new at this. This will be the eighth week that I've streamed. Um, yeah, the eight, the eighth, it's the seventh episode, but I, I, uh, I took a week off cause I was at a convention. So this is week number eight for me. Uh, I've been doing, including the test streams. That means I've been going for about three months at least one stream a week. The last two weeks I've done two streams a week. So there's that. Um, yeah, it's a process. It's a learning process. I am feeling more comfortable in general, more comfortable talking to the camera, talking to you guys. Um, but it is, it is something that I'm working on. Um, and don't be afraid to, to give me feedback. Um, I'm, I'm totally open to that. So yeah, don't hesitate. Yeah, yeah. Love feedback, feedback's good stuff. So, outlines, structure. The shark in the background is actually uh, one of two diagrams I kind of just doodled on the wall there. I'm not gonna be referring to them super hard, so you're not gonna need a uh, close-up view or anything, but they are the basic, the basic idea of a three-act structure and a five-act structure, which are the two main types of storytelling. Uh, going back all the way to um, Aristotle's Poetics, um, yeah, Aristotle's Poetics, which was written in the classical era the heyday of Greek culture. Um, and uh, for those of you from the uh, 
North American world. Um, so, not not you, Johnny. Ha. Um, you'll know things like five acts. F well, five acts tend to be used in things like Shakespeare. Um, yeah, that's fine. I'm gonna have I'll have zoomed in what like blown up ones when I get into more detail. I just wanted to draw them on the wall to have something on the wall, you know. Um, so yeah. We got stuff. So what do all stories have? Um, that's kind of where we want to begin, right? We want to we want to have the um, we want to have the basics. You know what 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 elements are. Or what elements make up a story? So, four, three weeks ago? Three weeks ago? We'll talk about these a little bit more. Ooh, that one's, that one's nice. So this is basic. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, three weeks ago, I talked a little bit about the five main things that, that make up story. So, they were character, plot, setting, theme, and conflict. And today, uh, because of what we're talking about, we're going to talk about conflict, and we're going to talk about uh, plot. Because those are the two most important things to how your story is constructed uh, in terms of moving it forward. Uh, character plays a big part of this as well, but we're not going to talk a ton about character today. Um, just some generalizations more than anything else. So there's that. Um, yeah. Uh, but the reason character is important is because characters and their wants and needs, not just your main character, but all the characters, drive the plot forward, drive the action forward. So you need characters with believable wants and needs in order to have a good conflict that will drive your plot. Okay, we're on the same page. Well, yeah, we're, we're all on the same tab. It's right here. <laughs> but yeah, so to facilitate this discussion, we're gonna break it down real simple. Beginnings, middles, and ends. If you've ever taken a literature class, high school, elementary school, beginnings, middles, and ends. Those are the three parts of a plot, beginning, middle, end. So yeah, we'll start with that. If you if you don't know what your character wants or needs, then you need to go back and start from their backstory again and build up uh, a psychology for them so that you can uh, derive a want and need because of that. Keeping in mind, that in most cases, wants and needs are different. 
and are almost in opposition to each other. They don't have to be, but in a lot of cases they are. Uh, the reason for that is because uh, there's what's called a status quo. And the status quo is basically how everyone fits into the universe. Like, I'm a streamer and a writer. So my status quo is that I'm going to stream and write. Like, that's, that's where I fit into this story universe of the fictional me. And say something happened that caused me not to be able to write or uh, not to be able to stream or, or something that would change that, that's changing the status quo. And what that does is, is, in most cases, the want of the character is to return to the status quo. Because that's, that's what we liked. That's what we had. Um... Like, that, that, that's, that's what I want to be. I want to be a streamer and a writer. So if, if something happened that I couldn't do that, I, I try and re restore the status quo. I try and get back to that. Figure out how I, can, how I can start writing again or start streaming again. So the way that this works is then, but what, what do I need as a character? Do I need to be a writer again? Or maybe I need something completely different, but I don't know that I need it. And in searching for what I want... And getting what I want, because ideally that, that's how, well, not ideally, but in a lot of cases that's how the character realizes what they want isn't actually what they need, is by getting what they want and realizing that it's, it's, it, it didn't fulfill them in the way that they thought it would. Right? So... Yeah, like in, in a lot of cases, the want and the need of the character are different uh, and, and oppose each other. They don't have to. Um, there's plenty of good examples where um, where they're, they're not necessarily all that different. Uh, sometimes what you want is exactly what you need. The resolution of that story won't necessarily be as satisfying. Um, and in fact, in my opinion, probably wouldn't be. But it also depends on the realizations of the character and how they approach those problems. Um, so yeah. And, and the other thing to keep in mind is uh, in the example I just stated, uh, the character of me wants to return to the status quo. There also is a type of story which tends to be more of a coming of age style story uh, that the character is part of the status quo and wants to change the status quo. They want to become something different. Right? And that's why I say a coming of age style story where they're stuck in a rut and they, they want to escape that rut. So they, they make, they make changes. And through those, the, the, through their want line of wanting to make a change, they discover what they actually need whether or not that's to return to the way the status quo was because they were true they were actually happy and didn't and, and didn't realize it or that there's something even more drastic that needs to happen in order to for them to to figure out what they want so yeah that's that's kind of the way that I approach it and the the uh, I mean I was reading said field right and in, in screenplay, Sid Field talks about uh, a character exercise that he did with some of his classes where he started from a name. He's like, class, give me a name. And then he asked for an occupation. And he got an occupation. And he said, well, you know, why... Why did they choose this occupation? Well, that's what they studied in school. Why did they study it in school? Because there was something that happened with their parents when they were young that, that changed their mindset so they would study that. I mean, it, you, you go down the rabbit hole at that point. But starting from, from those kind of basic building blocks of saying, hey, he was born at this time, contextually in the setting, what happened during that time that could influence them? What major events on the world? I mean, 
Me, uh, I'm almost 25. Uh, I grew up, you know, I remember September 11 as a kid. Uh, I remember um, a lot of the war in Iraq. I had uh, some of my friends' dads and stuff served overseas. Dads and older brothers served overseas. Um, I remember the Irish voting law where, you know, gay marriage was finally accepted in Europe, in, in parts of Europe. Um, there's, there's lots of the things that have influenced me as a person. Just like there's lots of things that have influenced you as a person. Uh, politics. I know it's not necessarily someone who follows politics, but people who, who, people in power who make decisions influence things. And that has a trickle down effect. Maybe I'm not into politics, but someone I, uh, someone I admired really was. And so changes in politics affect someone I admire. So that changed how I interacted with certain things. It's a, tr it's, it's. In a lot of ways, I approach things like that in the same way that we talk about chaos theory. You know, a, a, butterfly's, a butterfly's wing beat in Japan causes a tsunami halfway around the world. <laughs> and if you, if you kind of sit and, and, and study yourself, like really sit down and say, you know, what memories stick out? And there's reasons they stick out. Um, what, um, like what memories stick out? Why did they stick out? Um, how have those affected me? Good and bad. Um, how did, um, how did where I live change my perspective on things? You know, there's a difference living in suburbia compared to the inner city. If you moved around a lot, if you have lived in the same house since you were a kid, those are, those affect your, that those affect you. And therefore those also affect characters and how, how characters approach those things influences plot influences conflict and so therefore matter to to what we're talking about right now but just to, to story as a whole right so yeah um and and i'm gonna spend probably like the next episode i'm gonna do really heavy on character um i think that's the plan uh, so hopefully that will be a thing, but yeah, like I'm going to dive heavily, like deep into character and what make characters tick. So look forward to that. <laughs> and and it, it, that moment, that moment where you realize you're like 35 minutes in, 40 minutes in almost, and, and you really have only spent five minutes talking about your topic. <laughs> yeah we know we know we're doing well when so focus Brendan focus focused now <laughs> yeah Thanks, Ronnie. I tried to break it down a little bit less terms and a little bit more concrete examples. I realized um, that I don't use examples enough. Um, it, it's an effective tool uh, that I really don't use enough and I should use more. So that's kind of the approach that I wanted to take with this episode today. Where instead of just being like, oh, hey, so here are the parts of a story. Here's the parts of structure. And just, and just visualize that. I'm, I really want to sit down with my, with my word processor open and just be like, that, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take my synopsis and detail this out for you. 
So yeah. Um, and, and I'm glad that, that people are learning things. I'm glad. And I did see you there, Sparky. So th thanks for coming. Keep lurking. I'm all good with that. As long as you're learning something. So yeah. This, yeah, it's in that direction. This is the common five act structure. So like I said in the beginning of the episode, there are two main types of structure, of, of plot structure for storytelling in, in, in classical thought. There's the three act and the five act. Five act tends to only be used for drama nowadays and even then not as nearly as much as it used to. Uh, it, it's heyday other than maybe in dramatics, like, um, because Greek theater used a lot of five act sort of style plays, uh, but it, it, it kind of peaked at around uh, Shakespeare. So you don't tend to see it a ton anymore, especially because a lot of drama has actually changed to two act plays or one act plays uh, for time and, and uh, casting reasons. That being said, um, every act will have a beginning, middle, and end, and every scene in an act will have a beginning, middle, and end. Um, so it doesn't really matter how many acts you choose to do, as long as they're consistent with what they're trying to do, and they have a beginning, middle, and end. Right? Um, so yeah. And I'll talk a little bit about more about these uh, these terms, uh, but we're gonna jump to the three act structure because the three act structure is the most common way. Um, let's blow this up a little bit. Why don't we? Boom. Hopefully that's not too blurry. Uh, the three act structure is the most common story structure uh, used today. It's what they use in movies. Uh, it's what they use in novels, it's what they use in um, short stories, though that gets a little bit more complicated and we'll talk about that. Um, but yeah, this, this is the most common style. Inherently, the two cover basically the same things, but they cover them in a slightly different um, style, uh, especially the amount of time spent on certain elements differs between the two. And uh, Johnny, Johnny, Johnny says to me, apparently writing is all about psychology. And yes, writing is, in, is inherently about psychology. Um, because like any real, like any real uh, sort of art form, uh, there's a huge amount of emotional content and I don't mean necessarily from the writer's side. Um, how the viewer, uh, and I'll use viewer as a general term, I mean the viewer could be a reader, it could be um, uh, someone sitting in a movie theater, it could be you sitting on your couch at home watching TV. But how the viewer identifies with the characters, how the, uh, how the viewer can suspend their disbelief in order to um, in order to uh, to get into the story, uh, especially that one that has um, elements that are made up or imaginative or, or not of this world, you know, science fiction, speculative fiction, horror, that kind of thing. Um, that how we approach writing and, and how we tell stories is as much about the the author's emotional uh, emotional impact as it is about the viewer's emotional impact. How they're how they're feeling when they read something. And, and every reader is going to have an inherent bias towards certain things. Um, as as a writer, we talk a lot about character names. Um, that character names. What we name characters, uh, or 
how we understand characters' names, like just by give, being given a name, gets inherently biased by other people we've met with that name. Or other stylistic choices similar to that name. Uh, so, for example, um, if I named a character Rebecca, you'd be reminded, uh, say, say there was a really horrible, annoying person named Rebecca in your life. And I hope there's no one named Rebecca in the chat, because I'm not talking about you. But you would be inherently, you would inherently, like, you would feel a little bit of anger or hate or annoyance every time you saw that name because of, you'd be subconsciously thinking about that person. Or maybe it's your best friend's name and you inherently like that person even though they're a villain because of the name. And there are things like that. How the, how the, the author approaches that is we tend to base character names on the exact same thing. Like if I think of, uh, if there's an annoying character I want to write, I'm going to write him, I'm going to write her as Rebecca, right? Like we're, we're subconsciously biased towards that. So in saying that, The whole idea is that psychology plays a huge role in both us as the writer and as the reader. Uh, symbols, um, and I mean, it's it's kind of funny that you talk about psychology in that way. Uh, everyone knows Sigmund Freud, or most people know Sigmund Freud. Most people know him as a quack nowadays, but to be fair, contextually, uh, he was ahead of his time. Fair enough. There's a lot of weirdness there, I get it. But his student, Carl Jung, studied dream theory and symbols uh, with respect to psychology. And Carl Jung, his theories are actually more applied by English students than psychology students. Because all those thoughts that, that we, he studied about um, social interactions and, and social theories of symbols are super applicable to, to writing and are used by authors for years and years and years. Um, I mean, I'm a big advocate of reading the Bible at least once, not because I'm particularly religious or anything, but because there are so many uh, stories in, in, in the Bible that have influenced uh, at least the English canon for hundred like thousands of years, right? Like there's years and years and years. Uh, Dante Alighieri, I'm a big fan of Dante's Inferno. Um, heavily influenced by by Christianity, but also heavily influenced by Greek and Roman culture. Um, there's a whole bunch of other stuff and symbols and, and things in that. Um, so yeah, like knowing symbols and, and knowing how people react to symbols and, uh, and how society approaches things is, is important um, to, how, to how we write a story. Um, so yeah. Cool. So, I hope that illuminated something. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, three act structure. This guy right here. Um, there's a few really important elements. This one has a lot, and I really like this, but uh, you don't need every single one of these. 
um, necessarily. Uh, or at least to start, anyway. But, uh, yeah. So, the th there's, for me, there's three, um, there's two important elements, and then there's four sections. So the first, uh, I guess we'll start from the beginning. It's easier to start from the beginning. So act one, act one is the setup, the introduction. You introduce the reader to the setting, the characters, their wants, not necessarily their needs, but what they want in general and the main conflict. And there is some sort of element one, inciting incident. Something happens that causes the character to have to take some sort of action in order to pursue their want slash need. Uh, then, you have the rising action, which is this giant section here. In pursuit of their want slash need, the character is confronted by obstacles, which create conflict and drama, and make the story interesting. At the end of Act 2, you reach the climax. Element two. The climax is the point of highest dramatic tension in the story. It's where the emotions are highest. It's very, um, the final confrontation is near and the character makes a decision and or realizes something about themselves in that, in that situation. Which then leads to the act three, uh, the falling action, uh, the events leading towards the resolution of the story, um, and then you have the denouement, or the wrap up ending resolution, in which you tie all of the story threads together, your characters experience something, he's learned something about himself. Um, stuff like that, right? So, what does that mean? <laughs> Why does this stuff matter? Um, structure is one of the really hard things about writing. And... Johnny's complaining that writing seems more complicated than drawing because it's a lot more work. And the answer is kind of, but not really. It's just that the work is different. <laughs> and yeah, uh, whether what type of act structure you use, uh, is entirely up to the author and depends on the story. Um, which is actually the next item on my list where I was going to talk a little bit about idea line. And I talked about this uh, in episode two, I think, uh, where certain ideas are better, su su are better suited to certain mediums and certain uh, lengths of story. Um, so because of that, how you interact with the three act structure differs based on the type of story you're telling. For example, the core, the current personal short story I'm writing, uh, outside of the one that I'm working on for this is a short story. Well, I said that it's a short story. I am starting the story right here. 
the scene right before the climax. Because in a short story, you don't really have time in order to do all this stuff. You don't have the time, you don't have the space. It's not interesting to your character. You need to, it's not interesting to your audience. You need your audience to get into it as soon as possible. So the closer you start to the end of the story, the better it's gonna be with short stories. Um, that's not necessarily true of novels or longer forms, but it is true of shorter forms, for sure. You wanna start as close to the end as possible. Because at least I've found, uh, and I've talked to a few other writers in the last couple weeks about certain similar things, but I've found that we have a tendency to hide all the cool stuff until later. You know, you're not gonna see the cool mech until act two, right? But people reading your story really just wanna see the cool mech. And the sooner you give that to them, the more, the, the more, the more they're gonna be, in, be interested in the story and the more they're gonna be invested in the story. And that's probably a bad example because not everyone's into mechs. Uh, mechs being giant robots. But the idea being that trying, like, keeping everything hidden and secretive and elusive is not that interesting. It's not as interesting as you think it is. Everyone goes for that twist reveal, right? And they're hard. They're hard because they have to be set up in the right ways. They have to be set up in ways that are interesting to the reader without giving anything away but at the same time have to seem like they're not holding anything back because at least the way that I approach movies or films or, or, or books that do things like that is I get frustrated I get frustrated when you when they hide things because I know that they're hiding something and having too many questions can really put a reader off. Um, it's one of the main reasons why the X-Files kind of bombed when it did. Um, and, and, and other things. Yeah, twist reveals are super hard. Um, they're one of the hardest things to do in my opinion. Not because coming up with something twisty is hard. It is hard in and of itself, but because everything leading up to the twist has to make the twist worthwhile, and in most cases, at least the stuff I've worked on that have twist reveals, um, they're less interesting because of the twist reveal. Because all of the interesting stuff happens with the twist and not before. So there's no reason for the reader to even get into it like to, to sit down and read far enough to get to the twist. Yeah, they're, they're really difficult. Um, I cut mine, basically. I started the scene before the, the climax where there's still kind of a twist reveal, but all most of the cards are on the table. There's not, there's not elusive stuff. It's not me being clever Look at me, I'm, I'm clever. I, I have all these things planned that you're going to see eventually. So yeah, difficult. Yeah, uh, and Inkart's an interesting example. Was that not the one they did the movie of? Did they do a movie of Inkart? Or am I thinking of something else? Oh, I'm thinking of Aragon. That's not Inkart. But yeah. Um, put your interesting stuff at the beginning. Put your interesting stuff at the beginning. Get people into it. Show them the world. You don't have to give everything away. But if you give them breadcrumbs they're going to follow. It's the way it is. 
and, and it's one of those things where structure it is kind of both the thing that allows us to be most creative, but also the thing that allows that that holds us back the most. Because structure is what makes movies predictable. But at the same time, if you don't have good structure, if you don't have good structure, your story is not going to be interesting. So you kind of have to tread this balance of being boring or predictable or both. And that sucks. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, storytelling has been around since I mean oral storytelling specifically has been around for I think is it 8,000 years? Um, and, and to be honest in my opinion and I'm not a history expert by any means but from the things that I've read about storytelling that well, I mean, think about it this way. I mean, I talked today about Aristotle's Poetics, which was written in somewhere around 600 BC. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> Man, I do bad with dates. You're real bad with dates. And geography. I'm bad at geography. Real bad at geography. Um... Uh... Is what the internet's for. Um, yeah, here we go. Nice. Poetics. Oh, it's actually earlier than I thought. It's three thirty. 335 BC. So techniques from almost two, almost 2,000 years ago are still relevant today. Storytelling is a long ongoing tradition. Um, and that's not to say it hasn't changed at all. There are always new things happening um, for example, VR, film, film is, um, the second, maybe third, second or third youngest of the main mediums right now, artistic mediums right now. Uh, the only ones that are potentially younger are comics and video games. And... If you think about it, excuse me. If you think about it, film is is about 120 years old, give or take. Writing is if we if we go back as far as poetics is almost 2000 years old. Art goes back even further. So you start to see that in terms of how we talk and, and discoveries that we make and, and the way that we do things, especially in these techno technological mediums, is, is a new thing. We are learning as, as, as a culture, as a global culture, we are learning how to tell stories in these mediums how to do things, what's the best way to do things. When TV first came around, or even film to a certain extent, but it was more apparent in TV, but all the people who started in film and television when they first started up were theater people, actors, play directors, producers, 
They were theater people. And so, what did they do? The first thing they did was they started doing plays in front of a camera. Because that's what they knew. And then a few bright people came along and said, well, what else can we do with that? Georges Méli, for one, theater musician. He started experimenting with cuts, with moving things around, with playing what the camera can and can't do. Things that you can't do in a theater setting. And then someone else said, well, what if we started, started taking different reels and splicing them together? What if we start jumping between cameras, have multi-camera setups? What if we move the camera as we did it? This is how we've developed a visual language of filmmaking. It's a process. We're learning as a culture. So, yeah. Anyway, I'm sweating to death. I need to fill up my water bottle. I'm gonna take a five minute break. And then when we come back, uh, when we come back, I'm gonna open up my word processor and I'm gonna start banging out some of the concepts that I've talked about in terms of our short story. And one of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to give a working title to the story because I'm tired of calling it the first short story or the accidental origin short story. It needs something that we can call it. So on my break, think of things. Classical fantasy, sirens, fawns, demons, go. All right. Taking a break. I'll see you in five. Where's my mouse? There's my mouse. Cool, we're good.